Well, thanks so much to Sarah for inviting us. We're thrilled to be able to contribute to your workshop today. We're going to introduce you shortly to the argument of our book, The Costs of Connection. But first, let's get straight to the heart of the matter. In some ways, we're increasingly familiar with the idea that code is colonial, that code's operations necessarily reproduce the neo-colonial conditions of their creation in today's United States and elsewhere. Here's a very an example of this familiar phenomenon that the algorithms which decided the allocation of health care in the United States to black citizens have built in them certain biases linked to racial divides, therefore seriously affecting the allocation of health resources to black people to their disadvantage. That's fundamentally important, and there are many cases like that. But we want to push this point further. Because, as leading STS uh, scholar Sheila Jasanoff put it, imperial projects do not end with colonialism. They may be resurfacing in new guises with the passage of time. And here we propose seeing the emergence of big data as a major new form of knowledge, as itself inherently, not just in its bad applications, as inherently a colonial project. And here's where we recall the insight of one of the leading decolonial theorists, the Peruvian sociologist Aníbal Quijano, who wrote, looking back on historical colonialism, that the repression of that colonialism fell above all over modes of knowing, of producing knowledge, producing perspectives over the resources, patterns, and instruments of formalized and objectified expression. In other words, data. Let me leave that thought hanging, and now I'll give, we'll start giving you the basic argument of the book. The question we pose in our book is basically very simple. What is going on with data? How should we frame the countless new, not so new, developments with data across business and government, society and data lives? Developments that for sure have accelerated during the pandemic. There are lots of ideas on the table, and almost all of them deal with the proposal of a new stage of capitalism, most famously Zuboff's surveillance capitalism. But we ask, is there something potentially even larger going on? Something truly momentous, a new phase in the relations between colonialism and capitalism. We get some hints of this in the business cliches of the past five years. For example, this well-known idea from the front cover of The Economist from May 17, that data is the new oil. Just a harmless metaphor, perhaps? Or is this phrase precisely the cover for a genuinely new reality that deserves truly the name colonialism? A central point in an argument is in fact that this is not a metaphor. We're using the word colonialism very specifically, not metaphorically, but to describe an emerging reality. We are essentially talking about a new phase in the relations between colonialism and capitalism, what we call data colonialism. Let me give you the definition of how Nick and I uh, label this. We say that data colonialism is an emerging order for the appropriation of human life so that data can be continuously extracted from it for profit. Now, this suggests perhaps that uh, we're making a comparison here while ignoring important differences. We are arguing that there are big differences between historical colonialism and data colonialism. There are differences in terms of the modes, the intensities, the scales, and the context. For instance, we're not arguing that we can expect to see the same level of violence that we saw in historical colonialism. But we are arguing that there is a very important similarity, and that is the historical function of both forms of colonialism is the same, and that function is to dispossess. Whereas the old colonialism grabbed land, the new one grabs us, our social lives, through the medium of data. But how is this being rationalized? Part of the reason this new social order is so effective is because it is based on rationalities with deep colonial past. Let's start, for instance, with cheap nature. 
in order to colonize the world, nature had to be framed as cheap. It was said to be abundant, free. From a legal perspective, it was said to be without owner, at least a civilized owner. That's where the concept of terra nullius comes from, no man's land, which allowed the colonizer to claim the land is empty, therefore it can be appropriated. From cheap nature, we move to cheap labor. Some humans in colonialism, and this was mostly determined by the race, were meant to provide the labor required to transform nature into wealth. So exploitation and abuse were thus framed basically as social progress. Colonialism was said to be for the good of all humanity, for the salvation of the colonized. We can then trace a progression from cheap neighbor, cheap nature to cheap labor to cheap data. And we can see some of the same extractive rationalities being applied here that we saw with nature and labor. Cheap data is said to be abundant without an owner, at least in its aggregate form. Um, and it's also something, a resource that requires processing. So our job is only to generate it and then big corporations with sophisticated technology are supposed to make something out of this resource. And we're told that this order is what progress now looks like. But what do we gain by looking at things this way? There are basically two types of advantage of a colonial approach to what's going on with data. Advantages of scope and advantages of depth. So let's start with scope, including time scale. A colonial approach understands what's happening with data in terms of not just the past 40 years of the emergence of the internet, but the past 500. And it looks far into the future too, seeing today's data extraction as a new historical form of resource extraction that will pave the way for a new capitalism, possibly decades in the future, just as historic colonialism paved the way for industrial capitalism 200 years later. The colonial approach also widens our sense of the scope of what's going on importantly with data, not just the usual suspects of social media platforms, but the expansion of surveillance across all forms, particularly of low paid work. The emergence of the gig economy as a new way of extracting value from labor at a distance. The emergence of logistics over three or four decades across all forms of industry as a way of tracking things, but also therefore in tracking people as well. And the expansion of internal corporate data, which never goes near a social media platform. A colonial approach also deepens our sense of what is being changed socially through data extraction. We argue that just as with historic colonialism, a fundamentally new social and economic order is being built, involving new forms of dependency, new forms of rule and governance, based of course, always on nice things such as convenience and customization, but always reinforcing older inequalities based on that neo-colonial legacy, inequalities of class, gender, and race. And then fundamentally, as I made the point right at the beginning, only a decolonial perspective will help us see that big data discourse itself is the latest version of the West's long attempt to impose a single version of rationality on the world. That's the advantages. Now let's look in just a little bit more detail on how we see this new social order being built. And here, because as we're stressing, we're looking at this as part of the unfolding relations between colonialism and capitalism, we also have to draw creatively on some of the best thinking around capitalism. In other words, the work of Karl Marx. But we do have to be creative here. Because for Marx, it was labor relations that were the main engine for reproducing capitalism as a social order. Obviously, labor relations remain important, but they can't be enough to understand what's going on with data. The reason is simple, because we know we're part of this order of data extraction, even when at the end of the week, we swap photos with friends and closest family, and we know we are not working, but we're still part of the order of data extraction. We therefore need to understand that order to another type of fundamental social relation, which we call data relations. Ways of reproducing social life to configure it precisely to optimize the extraction of data for profit. 
the abstraction of data collection fits perfectly with this creative interpretation of Marx for the 21st century. Why does this matter? Because it has a devastating result. That ordinary social life in all its messiness can become for the first time in its abstracted form of data, a direct factor of capitalist production, just like the seeds and manure that Marx thought about when he looked at the capitalization of agriculture two centuries ago. Let's switch gears and talk more specifically about the coloniality of data relations. And in the book, what we do is we conduct various transhistorical comparisons using the past, basically to understand the coloniality of data relations in the present. And we organize these comparisons following the same 4X model that we find in strategy video games. And that model is composed of explore, expand, exploit, and exterminate. This model is it's the same kind of strategies you apply when you play the video game you see in the background here, which is part of the Civilization series. This is colonialism, the video game. In it, you can play the Spanish, the British, the Dutch, or the French as colonizers. The natives and their lands and resources are of course controlled by the computer. They're not fully sentient. We don't have time to explore each one of these strategies, so I'll just focus on one of them, which is explore. And what I want to do here is compare two historical documents. The first one, which you can see on the top there, is Google Chrome's Terms of Service uh, uh, for their web browser. And in case you haven't read it, like most of us, that's what it says in part, which basically amounts to us surrender surrendering a lot of our rights when we install Google Chrome. I want to compare that to another document called the Requerimiento which in Spanish translates to the demand or the requirement. Now, this was a document read by Spanish conquistadors when they entered villages or cities in the so-called new world. They would sometimes arrive in the middle of the night under cover of darkness and proceed to read this document in Spanish to a population that obviously did not speak Spanish. That document in part said, but if you do not submit to Spanish rule, in other words, I certify to you that with the help of God, we shall powerfully enter into your country and shall make war against you in all ways and manners that we can and shall subject you to the yoke and obedience of the church and of their highnesses. We shall take you and your wives and your children and shall make slaves of them and as such shall sell and dispose of them as their highnesses may command and we shall take away your goods and shall do all the mischief and damage that we can. That's the Spanish Requerimiento 1513. Please click there to accept and install. Now, our point is not that what happened after the Requerimiento was read is the same thing that happens after you install Google Chrome. But we do wanna call attention basically to the use of this misleading and abstract foreign language to conduct the trick of this possession. Now, to wrap things up, how do we even begin to resist this order, to decolonize data? First thing, we have to realize that this is a multifaceted problem which amalgamates 500 years of injustices. So one track approaches are not going to work. Whether we opt out of specific platforms or we revise their codes, that's not going to be enough. We also have to realize that data processes must be grounded in social processes that are fair, accurate, and transparent. So the collection, the aggregation, the processing, the decision-making used with data need to be challenged. Uh, even the need for code needs to be challenged and the education of coders as well. They must respond to new modes of consent and participation and inclusion. All of this needs to result in basically a rejection of the universal rationality of data collection and extraction. This new divine mandate that says, I'm the sole and rightful owner of the data I collect about you. 
And lastly, we suggest that we have to learn from past and present decolonization struggles. There are people who have a very rich history of resisting colonialism, and we need to learn from them. We need to learn from them how to reappropriate technologies, how to form new forms of common knowledge and build new forms of solidarity, all by using a very important weapon against colonialism, and that is imagination. When colonialism could not be resisted with bodies, it could also be resisted with minds. So decolonizing data, we suggest, is primarily an exercise in creativity, collectively imagining what disconnection looks like and what new forms of connection might look like. Thank you very much for listening and we look forward to the Q&A.